Hello everyone, welcome to week three. And this week we get to go over your labor. And labor is such an important part of your business. It's an important part of your budget, it's an important part of your concept, the type of customer service you wanna have, the type of food you're going to prepare. It's an important part of the, what you want to do. So we get to go over it this week. But before we do, Jeff Jonathan, how was week two assignments looking? And for those who still have not done it, you still have a chance to do it if you get it in by tonight, 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time for that late submission. How was it looking? Um, good. Uh, one of the more common stumbling blocks that I saw this week was not including that concept summary right at the top of the assignment. <clears throat> Remember, you guys already did this in week one. It was right above the SWOT analysis where you wrote that one to three sentence concept summary. You're gonna need this not only for last week's assignment and this week's assignment and next week's assignment, uh, <laughs> but also week five and week six. So it's gonna be worth points on every single one of them. So make sure you have that somewhere where you can easily grab it. Um, <clears throat> but overall, I love seeing the differences in these regulations from state to state. Um, labor laws in particular have a huge, huge variety on what those minimum wages are gonna be. Some places have as restrictive as eight hour a day limits before you have to start paying overtime. Other places don't really care if you work your people to death as long as it's not over 40 hours a week. Uh, <laughs> so, Knowing what your area requires you to do is really important, and it's super important for this week's assignment because you actually have to pay your people this week, which we're going to talk all about. Yes, we are, and that's why we have everything going in order because everything builds off each other. All of these assignments build off each other. So you guys have to look up your labor laws, your overtime laws. That's gonna be especially important for this week's assignment when you're actually building your schedule. Um, but that's not the only thing you are going to be doing this week. So remember, your week two assignment, late submissions are due tonight. Your week three assignment is going to be once again due on Tuesday. Um, and you have a fun discussion this week to tip or not to tip. That is the question that you guys will be looking at. Um, so for your discussion, remember it is right here. If we go and we have this delightful little tip the waiter. <laughs> I love the little uh, icon here. And there are two different articles for you guys to look at. One pro tip, one against tips. And what your thoughts are. Do you think it's important to tip your, uh, to still tip employees? Do you think that it's a good idea to get rid of tipping in general? Do you think that's gonna help with your customer service or not? Um, you get to decide and you get to do this awesome discussion this week, which is due on Saturday at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time with two peer responses due on Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. And also remember, I agree or I disagree, that's a great thing to say, but you gotta back up what you're actually going to say. Why do you think that what your peers said was a great idea? What was it about it? Just don't say, I agree, that looked great. You have to go into actual explanation. Remember, we're building a conversation here. <clears throat> and it's not that much fun having a conversation if somebody only answers in one or two words, right? So say why you agree or why you disagree with what they said. And always remember with discussions, be nice about it. If you disagree, Remember, just politely disagree. It's very easy to type something not nice because you're not face-to-face -face with that person. So remember, take five minutes, take a deep breath, walk away if you have to. It's good practice for when you're in the kitchen staring at people that you may or may want to yell at. It's good practice for that now. Am I right, Chef? <laughs> 
He says, yes, yes, because the Lord knows I had to do that for the bed and breakfast. Going from being just in the back of the house to then having the B&B where a guest could walk into your kitchen at any minute definitely makes you change the way that you actually talk to your employees because you never know when a customer is going to come around the, you know, come around the corner. So, you know, it changes your, your stance and your viewpoint on how you actually should talk to people and, and whether or not you may or may want, may not want to throw them into the fryer as Laquina said in the group chat. Uh, don't go that far. It won't be as much fun. <laughs> But, uh, but for this week, we get to talk about your budget. And I want you guys to know, it's all, once again, it's all about that research, that research that you guys did in week two to figure out your overtime, to figure out benefits, all of that great HR stuff you need to figure out for your business because being a business owner, you wear many hats. You're the HR person, you're the accountant, you're the marketing guru, you're everything for your business. That being said, please do remember that no one is going to love your business as much as you do. This is your baby and you expect everybody like, oh, everyone is going to want to work for me. They're going to want to work every single day because it's such a great place. No, they don't. They want to have a life. They need to have that work-life balance. And so do you. You also need to make certain that as an owner, you do have that work-life balance. One, you need to make sure that your place can actually run without you and that things aren't going to fall apart the minute that you leave. Uh, because if you can't leave to go see a movie or go to a dentist appointment or go on vacation, it's not going to, you're not going to have any, you're not going to have a life. Your life is going to be your business. And for some, that's what they want. And that's great. But to have a healthy, healthy work-life balance, you need to have days off and you need to not work 90 hours. Um, I have done that. And so has Jeff Jonathan. Remember right, Jeff? You definitely work 90 hours, <laughs> especially at the place you work. <laughs> Many, many times. <laughs> yes, and you get burnt out. And so we don't want to see that happen. Right, Jeff? Absolutely. Um, the other thing is, when I was working 90, 100, up to 100, and I think 15 was my maximum hours in a week, I was never scheduled for that many. I just happened to be a salaried manager who was scheduled for 70 hours a week. So just because you're scheduling them for 70, you can usually salaried managers are going to work longer hours than what they're on the schedule for. So that's why you want to keep their scheduled hours short. Yes, because I've definitely done that before where I'm like, okay, it works. Like I opened, but then I saw one of my favorite guests was showing up like, oh my God, like Alex is going to be here and his wife Corinne is coming to this time. I totally have to see them when they show up, but they're showing up at eight o'clock at night and I would stay and talk to them until eight o'clock at night. So I was, I was supposed to leave at like two and then I ended up staying until like 10. So, and then have to go back in and actually open in the morning. And that's where, you know, you want to be able to plan accordingly, especially for your schedule. And when you're looking at doing schedules and you're looking at doing your labor, remember as an owner, or if you don't want to be an owner, that's totally cool. You can be a manager, you can be an executive chef, but as a management position, you need to be flying the plane. So imagine you are 30,000 feet up. You're seeing everything. You have a clear view of what the vision is for your business, the mission, what you want to achieve. But if you go back to doing that hourly employee type of work where you're going to be on the line, being in saute, being in the kitchen all the time, you can't see what's actually supposed to be happening because you're only focusing on one area. And if you only focus on one area, you don't know what's happening 
with the rest of your business. So that's why it's really important to get that view, get that 30,000 foot view from top so you know what, what is going on everywhere in your business. Am I right, Jeff? Absolutely. It's really easy to <clears throat> fall back into old habits because your entire career has been cooking on the line. But when you're cooking on the line, you have no idea what's happening with front of house. Honestly, you might have some idea of what's happening on the other stations on either side of you, but you're so busy in the weeds that you're really just focusing on that one station on the line. And so you can't get an idea of how the entire service is going when you as an owner are doing this hourly work, um, which can really derail the whole business. And that's a key part for your assignment this week. So remember this, because we are going to go over your assignment. Let me show you real quick. I made you beautiful slides. They are going to be on the main page for you. You can look them over. I'm even going to do a little video to go through all the little, all the slides in more detail. Um, but we do really want to focus on the assignment for this live session because it looks easy, but it's a lot of effort. It's not really easy. And this is part of being a manager. Being a manager, you have to build schedules. And then you're going to build schedules with people who have kids. You're going to build schedules for people who are um, going to want to, you know, have like dogs that they have to let out every six hours or college students who have finals and midterms like yourselves, right? You guys have uh, homework you have to do, you have assignments that are due, you have discussions and you also need to work. So you need to be able to juggle multiple people in multiple locations of your business and come up with a schedule that will really work for the entire operation to make certain that it's running smoothly. And this is really gonna go back to the type of concept you wanna have. What's the quality of the food you're going to do? Is this gonna be a food truck where you're gonna be super fast, I want this in and out? Or is it gonna be a Michelin star rated high-end place where people are making, you know, Caesar's uh, salads at the table, all of this great stuff. It's, that's really going to determine how many people you're going to have, how many people you're going to have per shift, and the type of hours of operation you want to have, and how much you're actually going to pay people. Because remember, a lot of places, you know, you know what your minimum wage is, are you gonna pay people minimum wage? Or are you gonna pay them more? Are you gonna stick to, you know, what is basic in your area? A great way to figure that out is going to like Indeed or Craigslist and seeing how much people are paying in your area. And you get a good idea if people are just paying minimum wage or they're saying, no, I'm gonna pay a line cook $15 an hour because that's what they need to survive in their area that they live because, you know, Boulder is super expensive. I just looked to rent a house in Boulder. Some of those houses are like $5,000 a month. I'm like, that is so expensive in Boulder. So do you think that somebody who's living off a minimum wage can really live in Boulder? Like actually live there <laughs> and be able to like survive off a minimum wage? Probably not. You're probably going to want to up the rate versus my friend who lives in the middle of nowhere in Illinois. I'm talking about like not Chicago, like four, like three hours south of Chicago in the middle of nowhere where you can buy a mansion for like $80,000. <laughs> like she would probably be able to like live off a minimum wage and be completely fine. Um, so we're going to go over your assignment. I do want to share with you real quick. If you guys want on these slides, these are, this is that classic brigade. Who created the classic back of the house brigade system? Anybody? 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 
You guys remember? It's, it's like right here, guys. <laughs> Who share? Yeah. Who made the classic brigade? Escoffier. Escoffier made the classic brigade system. This one right here for you guys. So you have all of these awesome back of the house names. I mean, I love it. Like the frittier, frittier, that's so much better. Like say that you're a frittier instead of a fry cook. That sounds so much better, right? I love that one. Um, or garmage. I love the garmage one where it's like, you make salads all day, but we're going to say garmage. Like absolutely love that. Um, but for those who don't want to use the fancy classic brigade, I provided, and here's some of the front of the house, once again, the fancy front of the house names. Um, but if you go to this link right here, it gives you all the different names for different uh, jobs in the kitchen. And it gives you little explanations for each one. So if you guys are curious what you will need for your restaurant, here is a nice little list for you to go off of. And then, um, once again, we talked about the concept. Remember what your budget's gonna look like. This is a great assignment to go over that. The type of hours is operation. Are you gonna be a food truck? All of that great, great stuff. And one other thing, where we have a schedule that you guys are going to do for your assignments. But for those who actually want a proper software, there are these two websites that you can go to, and uh, and these are places that use it: Five Guys Burgers and Fries and Pizza uh, Yogurt Land. These places use their website, which helps you track how many people were working. Um, it can help you, especially for if you're going to provide health insurance and benefits and those kind of things. You can use the, this type of software to track all of that for you, and it will automatically make the schedules and build it for you once you get that foundation in. But a great way to figure out that foundation, should I do this one? Yeah, here's another one, is by doing your delightful assignment. This assignment that's going to be due on Tuesday at 11.59 p.m., but you are going to start it now because we're going to go over it all right now for you. Am I right, Chef? Absolutely. So, hang on. There we go. Uh, I do want to say, before we get into this, this is going to take some time. You definitely want to set aside some time to get this done because it does take some time to fill this uh, template out. <clears throat> but, you're gonna download this template. There's a few things to know just right off the bat. Number one, concept summary right here in this cell. You're just gonna type in whatever it is. And even better, copy and paste it off that week one assignment. Um, <clears throat> but that is worth 15% of your grade. So just make sure, um, make sure to get that at the top. In addition, on this assignment in particular, I have, no idea if you've staffed appropriately, unless I know what your concept is, your hours of operation, your days of operation. Without those pieces of information in your concept summary, it's gonna hurt your grade more than that 15% because I won't know if you've staffed appropriately or not. So really, really important to have that in there. Um, in general, it does seem pretty straightforward. You're just gonna type in what positions you're gonna need on the left here. You're gonna give them a time in and a time out for each shift all the way through the week. This will add up your weekly hours for you. It'll give you all sorts of numbers. Um, this number in pink, you don't need to touch that. It'll tell you how many hours you scheduled that person for for that day and it'll automatically take out a half hour break if you have a six hour shift or longer. Once you have your whole week plugged in. And once in, again, real quick, Chef Jonathan, I do this every every term, but uh, you see how he's on that pink? You see that god awful, super long formula for you? Right there, Chef Jonathan did that for you. 
<laughs> you did that just for you so that you didn't have to do that. So <laughs> while you were doing this, I expect to see, thank you, Chef Jonathan, in your assignment, <laughs> in that little area where you can put messages. Put a little thank you in there because Chef Jonathan did that just for you guys. So it was one less step that you had to worry about. So give props to Chef Jonathan. They do it every term because that, that that is a formula and he did that just for you guys. So remember, give your little shout outs to Chef Jonathan. I expect to see emails. <laughs> You know, little thank you e cards, <laughs> something just for that alone. So you can now continue, Jeff. <laughs> thank you. Um, so if you've got an employee who's going to work the exact same hours on multiple days, you can just copy these two cells. Just highlight those two cells and press Control C or right click and select Copy. Um, and then you can just go to each day you want them to work that shift and plug it in and it'll just do all the work for you. So this will tell you the total weekly hours you have them scheduled for. If this is over 40 and it's an hourly employee, you're going to lose points because that's overtime. With a salaried manager, we want to see less than 60 hours a week on the schedule because like we were saying, as a salaried manager, chances are you're gonna end up working more hours than what you're actually scheduled for, and you wanna avoid that burnout. You'll notice I gave this person two days off. Really important to have days off. Uh, if you have them working seven days a week, once again, that's gonna be a problem, um, typically for labor laws, but also just in terms of overtime and burnout. So please, please, please give your people days off. The last thing you're going to do with each employee is pay them. So if it's an, an hourly employee, like say this is a fry cook, um, you'll give them an hourly rate. So I want to pay this person $15 an hour because they're amazing. So there you go, $15 an hour. This will actually tell you how much you're spending on that employee just in hourly wages over the course of a week. So if you're paying this person almost $500 a week. Um, if you are paying them a weekly salary rate or an, an annual salary, like say you wanna pay this person $52,000 a year, then you're gonna pay attention to this red box here. Annual salary divided by 52. So you'll take that, hang on, hang on. 52,000, 52,000, sorry, and divided that by 52, and that's your weekly salary, $1,000. Who do you guys think gets salaries? Managers, for sure. Yes. Yes, Samantha, managers. So remember, managers are the ones that will be on salary. Everybody else will be hourly. And you cannot just put every single person as a manager because you have them working over 40 hours. That will not be a great thing for your kitchen. <laughs> not only that, but most states have laws regarding salaried exempt managers. For the most part, they have to spend at least 52% last time I checked in a uh, supervisory role over three hourly employees. And so for each salaried manager, we're looking for at least three hourly employees. So if you've got a smaller concept where you've only got three, pe three four people, you're gonna be the only one on salary, which brings me to my next point. Uh, the first person you should schedule is the owner. This is going to be you. You want to include yourself in this um, schedule because as an owner, you play an important role in this concept success. And you want to include your own pay 
in your labor costs because you have bills to pay. You got to pay rent or mortgage or car payments or food, dog food, dog <laughs> food. whatever the case may be. You have your own personal bills and you cannot be successful at work if you are not taking care of things at home. So you want to include yourself as an employee. This is another separation between you as a person and you as a company. Your company is separate from you personally. So the first, if you want to be an executive chef owner, you'll just do owner chef. Uh, if you want to be a general manager type owner, you can do that too. Owner slash GM, whatever your role is in that concept. What you can't do is do owner slash cook. Because as an owner, like we were saying, you can't be that front lines employee kind of in the trenches. You can kind of pop in and out to make sure everything's running smoothly and show your employees that you're actively there with them. But you can't spend the majority of your time doing that or you lose sight of the business as a whole. And also remember, as an executive chef, you are not really cooking either. If you're up, like if you're an executive chef, you are looking at the numbers, you are doing the orders, you are you're actually not in the kitchen. You tell people what to cook, but you are actually not cooking. You can cook for fun, be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go in, and keep my hand in, so to speak. Um, but for the majority of it, as an executive chef, you're not really cooking. So be prepared for that. <clears throat> yeah. So next up, I just want to show you a couple examples of what this schedule could look like for some different types of concepts. So let's say I'm going to do a pub and it's going to have be an American style restaurant utilizing table service with 200 seats. I've got my hours of operation 5 to 9 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday, so days of operation, and I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. So with this larger restaurant, I'm going to need a lot of staff, right? So the first thing that I would do if I were you creating a schedule is get your managers in place first because you need to have time before you open to get things prepped and ready to go. So we want to see people in at least an hour before service. And you're going to need time after service to get things closed down, cleaned up, Tills counted, those types of things. So at least an hour after service. And at all times when anyone's in your concept, you have to have a manager on duty, somebody who's responsible. So that's why I like to start with my management team because then I can make sure that I have a manager in place at all times that I plan to have anybody else there. So in this one, I've got owner executive chef first, front of house manager. I've got two sous chefs. And then I've got some back of house staff, saute, pantry, grill, fry. <clears throat> um, so I've got that back of house staffed. Then I need to think about front of house too, right? Because this is a restaurant. So I've got bussers. I've got bar backs and bartenders, servers. There, I even have a dishwasher, which is fantastic to have if you didn't know this already. Uh, so I've got everybody scheduled in. You'll notice that people are in at different times throughout the day, um, kind of a staggered coming in, but most everybody's out around 10 p.m. So that gives time at the end of the shift to get things closed up. It allows me to get prepped and ready to go beforehand. I have my two salaried managers right at the top here and they are under 60 hours a week. And all of these wonderful hourly employees are at less than 40 hours a week. So I'm not in overtime anywhere. Everybody's got two days off because hey, my concept is closed two days a week. That made things a little simpler. If I was open seven days a week, I'd have to have more staff and kind of shift through so that people had days off, right? Finally, in Omaha, Nebraska, I have a different minimum wage for my front of house staff, and I know they're gonna make good money on tips. So I paid them pretty close to that minimum wage. 
However, my back of house staff is quite a bit above that minimum wage. And my sous chefs are even higher because they've got responsibilities that the other folks don't. So I need to pay them appropriately for their experience, for their responsibility, for their knowledge and hard work. Um, so that's a restaurant. Any questions about a restaurant concept and kind of what we're looking for in general? And remember one thing, just because that person is in salary, if you say, oh, I'm gonna pay it like, pay that person $700 a week, but then you have them working 90 hours, there is a good shot that you are not actually hitting minimum wage. So remember, if you decide like, well, you can't base the schedule off of a 40 hour work week if you expect them to work 60 hours a week. You have to go off that 60 hours because that is what they're going to work. So what are they making per hour so that you can be certain you are actually getting minimum wage. So for example, I looked at what Chef Jonathan did and I did that delightful little calculation right here where it was, he paid uh, him, the owner, that $1,154 and he was working 57.5 hours per week. And so he's making 20 bucks an hour, so that's good. But if you were like, oh, well, I'm just gonna pay, I'm gonna make them work 600, you know, like I'm gonna pay him $600 a week and he's going to work 72 hours. Chef, you had zero divided by 600. Uh, I just saw that too, yeah, 600 divided by 72, there we go. He's making eight bucks an hour. That's also where it's really important to look at how much is your sous chef making? Is your sous chef making more than? then your actual manager or, you know, that's going to be a problem. No one's going to want to manage for you. So think about that when you are looking at the schedule. Because a lot of times people think, oh, well, I'm just going to do this much and they're going to work this much. And then you find out, I mean, $8.33, that would be illegal in Colorado because Colorado's minimum wage is $11.10. So Remember those aspects when you're doing this assignment. Also, are there any questions so far? Anything right now? No, Maurice said no. All right. So let's go on to the next example that's not a restaurant. So this one, is a food truck. Oh, that's my favorite one. <laughs> so with a food truck, it's a very different kind of concept, right? But if you think you're gonna be able to do it just yourself, that's not gonna happen. Uh, remember, you're gonna need a lot of time before service to get things prepped because you've gotta prep in a commissary kitchen. And then you have to load all that product onto your food truck and make sure that it's stored in a way that it's not gonna all fall over on you the second you open that fridge. Um, then you've gotta actually drive to where you're serving. So you need a significant amount of time before and after service to get things opened up and closed down because of that. Because at the end of the day, you have to do it in reverse. You gotta take everything off the food truck and store it in your commissary kitchen. You gotta drive to the commissary kitchen. You're gonna need to clean the food truck, all the equipment. You're gonna need to store everything appropriately and clean the commissary kitchen. There's a lot of breakdown required with a food truck. So definitely give yourself some extra time on either end. The other thing is you can't handle money and then cook food without washing your hands. That doesn't work. And you will get nailed by the health department in a heartbeat. So you are going to need at least one front of house person at all times during service who can interact with guests and handle the money and get the right order to the right person because food trucks really busy and it's just a line. There's no table numbers to write down. So you got to have somebody who's pretty good with people to man that position. 
you're going to need at least one cook to be in place in the food truck while you're in service. And um, <clears throat> you're going to need at least one cook to go with that cashier. A lot of food trucks have two people because it does get really busy and you've basically got an entire line inside this tiny food truck. So. Now, how many people have actually seen that movie, uh, Chef? Do you guys remember, have you seen that movie? The movie Chef? I see a no, or no, no. It's about a guy who goes, he gets a food truck. You know, he had like a mental breakdown because he worked too many hours and yelled at the food critic and he had a mental breakdown and he got a food truck and he decided to take that food truck all across the U.S. and decided that that was a great idea. But that doesn't really work in the real world because that health department requires you to have that commissary kitchen. That health department requires you to have the proper licensing that you guys just looked up. Um, and like he just went around with all that food in the back of his truck for all those different places. No, that doesn't work. It does not work. So I'm glad that people did say no for those who are watching the live session and you have seen it. Remember, that is not reality for having a food truck. My friends have food trucks and they have to go to a commissary kitchen before and after. It usually takes them an hour and a half to clean up after. So remember that for their concept, they do like a slew of mac and cheese um, as their food truck concept and mac and cheese is messy. So <clears throat> they spend about, uh, uh, what is it, like two and a half hours before prepping and getting everything going, and then they spend an hour and a half after cleaning. And that two and a half hours includes them driving to the different locations. Um, so remember that when you're looking at your schedule. Like, you have to drive to those places. You have to cook in those commissary kitchens. You cannot just be like, oh, I can do it by myself, because that will not fly not for especially with mac and cheese god like so messy so messy <laughs> am i right chef <laughs> Bummer to that for it's working you guys hear me you got really quiet all of a sudden oh that's weird can you hear me now can everybody hear me? No? Yes? So, commissary kitchen, um, or sorry, remember that uh, if you do have multiple people working, you want to be open every single day, you can have a lead cook in your uh, food truck. It doesn't have to be you every single day. Uh, so you can actually have that lead cook but they need to get paid more and you need to title them lead cook. That way I know that they have a supervisory role. So I'm double checking my audio to make sure it's working properly. You, it sounds great now. Oh, okay, good. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. So does anybody else have questions about a food truck? How many people are going to do a food truck? People? No, I see no in the chat. No, no, okay. Just remember when we were talking about that prep time and that cleanup time, that's going to be the same case if you're going to be a caterer or a personal chef. You need that extra prep time and cleaning up time. Perfect. <laughs> Brings me right to my last example here. Uh, this one is for a catering company. Now with a catering company, I definitely get that you're not gonna have an event every single day of the week in a lot of catering companies until you're a pretty big company. But 
I want you to schedule it like you have Saturday, Sunday events. That way you, you're going to have to schedule some time leading up to that event to get things prepped, get things ready, make sure you have the inventory in place, ready to go before the day of the event. So with my catering here, once again, this very top person is the owner and they are also acting as a chef. And then I also have a sous chef for additional supervisory support here. You'll notice that the owner is in on a day when nobody else is. Chances are you're gonna be meeting with clients. You're gonna be trying to develop that business and keep getting the word out there because you are totally dependent on new business all the time as a catering company. And you're always gonna be meeting with prospective clients. In addition, you're probably gonna be receiving orders. Um, you are gonna be doing administrative duties like the books and creating new schedules to go along with those new events that you're, you're booking. Uh, taking a look at your costs. There's a million and one things you're going to do as a owner and chef. And so you're probably going to be in at times when nobody else is as a caterer. Um, some other things, you'll notice that people start coming in two days before my first event. My first event here is on Friday. In this case, I have events Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so I've got people coming in two days ahead of time to start getting ready. This gives the owner and the sous chef time to get a game plan together, time to start to get things in place and prep and uh, produce the food that they're gonna need. And then the day before I've got even more people in to prep. And then the morning they're prepping, getting things loaded up, getting things to the event site, starting that event. Um, <clears throat> I have somebody here who is going to supervise when both of those people go home. So even though they're gonna be cooking, that front of house staff is gonna have a little more to do with this particular catering company. And I've made that clear by saying this person has supervisory duties. It's really important you let me know when somebody else is gonna be a supervisor. And you'll notice they get paid a good amount of money, which is another big thing with a catering company. Most caterings, you do not get tips for. Front of house staff, your servers, they're not gonna get tips. And if you pay them three bucks an hour, you are gonna be paying that tip credit to get them up to minimum wage at the end of every single event. And it's gonna be unplanned expenses, which is no good. You want to pay them quite a bit of money to get the talent that you want, people who are really confident servers and really know what they're doing and can represent you well. Uh, so you're gonna have to approach your front of house staff a little bit differently as a catering company than you would as a, say a restaurant where you can expect people to be tipping. And remember, the, the front of the house, the kitchen, these people are doing more because I have definitely been to caterings where we are setting up in the middle of the mountains. There is nowhere in sight. We have a tent, we have tables, we have chairs, we have decor linens. We are setting every single thing up and tearing every single thing down. We are loading the garbage up in my old school F-150 to drive back down to the mountains to put in our garbage, our, our uh, God, I'm Thank you. The, the dumpster. Wow, that totally just <laughs> left my head. So remember that. Like that's why it's important to pay appropriately because they have a lot to do. They are running around. Another key thing to remember is be nice. Be nice to everybody on the schedule. Do not schedule somebody to close at 1 a.m. and expect them to open at 7 a.m. That's not nice. I have done that before, especially with caterings, where I would have to go in because I was also the baker, so I had to go in and bake the bread, then get everything ready for the catering, then be the catering chef on site. 
and work from 5 a.m. all the way until 3 a.m. That was a really, really long, long day that I never want to do again. And then have to go back in at 5 a.m. At that point, I just stayed up and stayed there. So remember that to be nice. That's especially true for caterings, especially when you're going far away. Um, if you're going far away, you have to bring all of that equipment back and clean it. So remember that, and it's always better to clean it that night than leave it for the next day because that stuff just sticks and it dries and it's horrible and it takes twice as long to do. <laughs> Am I right, Jeff? Big time. I've, I've had to deal with that before. I was not a happy camper. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it's already bad enough when you're like driving up to the mountains and you're in the middle of nowhere and then it's already like starting to dry on the way back down. Um, but yeah, no, it just sticks forever. So remember that. And we never, we did not get tipped. If we did, there's a couple of times where I got tipped a bottle of wine, but that was it. There was no like actual getting like real tips. So remember that for when you are tipping your employees. Now we do have a couple more minutes. Am I right, chef? Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say something else. But it can wait. No, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Um, one of the really cool thing that this sheet does for you is it'll give you these numbers at the top. You don't have to do anything with these, but using this number, your total annual payroll, you can figure out how much you need to do in sales in order to sustain this labor. So once you have your, your whole schedule built out with all your employees in there, you can take that number total annual payroll and divide that by 0.3, just like we did with food costs and menu prices. This gives us how much sales we would have to have in order to have a 30% labor cost. And I see that over the course of a year, I need to do over a million dollars in sales. That's doable, but it is a lot of money. And so, if this is exorbitantly high, you might want to reevaluate how you've got your business set up and how many employees you're going to need. So if I take that total annual number and divide it by 52, I need about $21,000 every single week of the year and not to take a break ever. No vacations, no nothing. You know, closing it down for Christmas, I need to do $21,000 every single week in order to sustain that labor. So while you're doing this assignment, you want to think about how, how much you really need. You don't want to overstaff, but you don't want to understaff. This is uh, where it's also important to remember to not make think, oh, well, I'll just cut, I'll cut people and make people work more. If they're going to go over 40, then there may be an overtime. Remember, some states, this is why we had you guys look up this information, because if um, I'm in Colorado, I'm making $45,000 as a manager, and you're going to have me work overtime, you still have to pay me overtime. So remember those things when you're doing this assignment. That's why we had you look up the labor laws for your area so that now you know if you have to actually pay your salary employees overtime or not because that's never going to be fun. Overtime is always going to be more expensive for you guys. And also another thing to remember, uh, while this may be, you know, for your concept and whatnot, if we are telling you as a requirement to this assignment, to keep it at 40 hours and to keep it under 60 for your managers. We expect you to keep it under 40 and keep it under 60 for your managers. This is the requirement of the assignment. So if you say, well, I'm going to work every day, that's nice, but that's not what the assignment is about. This assignment is about creating a realistic, uh, a realistic weekly actual like schedule and picture it as you guys have already been established. 
don't think of it in the very, very beginning because yeah, you're going to be working a billion hours to get your business up and going. Look at the schedule as you're already like, what, like, what do you say, chef? Like two years in, three years in? Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. And then that way you have a good flow. You, you're already, you're established. Your, your name's out there. Think of it that perspective, not just, well, I, this is brand new. I have to work every single day. That's not what this assignment is about. So remember that. Do you guys have questions? <clears throat> now is the time. I'll probably now alone, not here. <laughs> You'll probably have a thousand when you're alone and not here. Well, luckily we went through this assignment pretty good. I already put the slides up there. And for you guys who are curious, like, well, how much do I pay people? Remember, things like Indeed is a great resource for you to really look at if you do want to, in fact, pay people more money. So, for example, let's look at it now. Uh, what position should we do? What do you guys want to do? Fry cook, baker, candlestick maker? <laughs> let's no. do baker, please. Baker. Okay, where are we living? And let's do Wesley Chapel, Florida. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Whew, that's good. I was like, I'm not going to spell that correctly. I'm glad that's just popped up. Look at that. So it shows Donut Crew, Crew Chef, Head Chef. It gives you some examples of different bakers. Fly in person, fly in person. Some places won't have it. Other places will. But you can get a sense of what they're actually going to be doing, how much work they're going to be putting in at these type of establishments, what's expected in your area. Because if I say I'm going to be a baker and then you're going to throw in, well, you're a bread baker and a cake decorator, that's going to be a little different than just being a bread baker, right? Versus doing pastries versus doing, you know, working at like nothing, nothing but cakes, that kind of thing. Hey, um, I'm the baker there, chef. Oh, are you? There you go. <laughs> So, and you can see the first couple had that salary and it shows you your salary estimates right there, full-time versus part-time. And remember, everybody doesn't have to be full-time. You can have part-time employees working at your places. There are plenty of people who work part-time because they are working to make their way through college. They're working, they're a mother of a young child like me and just want a part-time job. They don't want to work full-time, but they still want to be in the kitchen because they love it. Um, they want to stay sane and not, you know, seeing the wheels on the bus go round and round every single day. They want to have adult conversation. <laughs> So think of those things. Now, say if I wanted to be a fry cook for, um, let's do Cleveland, Ohio. Can I spell Cleveland wrong? But that's okay. It shows me it's 12 bucks an hour for a line cook, that kind of thing. So you can get a good idea. This place is $9.50 an hour. This one's $12, $16 an hour for line cooks. And then you can look this up. You know your area. You know these businesses. You know their concepts. You know what they expect. So you can get a good guesstimate. Am I right, Chef? You are. Can you pull that right back up? Yeah, I can. In some areas, on Indeed, it has this nifty thing on the right where it actually tells you what Indeed sees as the average for your area. Twelve forty-two per hour is the average for Cleveland, Ohio, for that line cook position. So that can be a really handy thing too. So definitely something to take a look at. Another thing, since we were just talking about bakers, and I know some people do have a bakery concept. Um, Eleven ninety six per hour. Yep. Um, bakers work insane hours. Uh, <laughs> they do. I was one. Three a.m. <laughs> can you talk about uh, bakery schedule just in general, real quick? Yeah, we can definitely. Because remember, 
uh, baker. And it depends on the type of baker you are. Are you going to be a donut shop? Are you going to be a pastry area? Like there's a place here that they do pastries and now they do breakfast in the morning. Um, but they do those pastries. I was also a bread baker. I was a cake decorator. Cake decorators typically have a different schedule. They can have more like regular hours than say a bread baker who or a bagel shop who expects fresh bagels, fresh donuts, fresh, fresh, bleh, fresh pastries right at 7 a.m. when the place opens. So don't be surprised if there are shifts that start at 11 p.m. and go until 7 a.m. I had the shift where I was started at 3 a.m. and I went until 11 a.m. That is because I wasn't not only the baker there, but I also prepped all of the breakfast goods. So I made sure the bacon was ready. I made sure the hash browns were done. I had to make the green chili. There's a green chili beer that is at the uh, brewery in town called Cooper Smith's, and I can never drink that beer because it reminded me too much of work. <laughs> so, because every single day I had to make that chili. So you can have someone like me who did a variety of jobs. My primarily, I was primarily the baker, but in between waiting for those breads to rise, I would bust out the lemon bars, I would bust out the cookies, I would make black moons. Even though people around here have never heard of black moons, um, the people from New England would be so over excited and <laughs> come in right away for the black moons because <laughs> can't find them uh, here. Uh, so remember, you will have crazy hours. That's going to be the same thing if you're going to be like working for a hospital. Because remember, hospitals are 24-7. Hospitals are every day. Hotels, you want to have a hotel, you're going to do room service. You have that potential to have room service at 3 a.m. So remember those type of things with your concept, what you want to do. And especially for a bakery, because there are different types of bakeries. So it really depends on what you are going to be making at that bakery. Because a lot of people will say, I'm a bakery, I do wedding cakes. Well, if you're a bakery doing wedding cakes, then that's going to have different hours than, say, a place that focuses on bagels or donuts, that kind of thing. So do remember that. Also remember, if you're a place that focuses on doing weddings and wedding cakes, I'm not sure if people are, but if you are, you have to deliver that wedding cake also. So remember to have a delivery driver who will be able to deliver the wedding cake. You also want that delivery driver to have a little bit of skill because in case something does happen, <laughs> they can fix it there. <laughs> and supervision when that delivery driver's on. Yes. Yes. And remember, also for that catering, if you are thinking I'm going to be high end, I'm going to be busy, you're going to want an event specialist working at your establishment too, who will be working with the clientele, making certain that the contracts are done and that the schedules are made for the food and all of that fun stuff. Making those fun checklists for everybody to follow. Are there any other questions? I see Gertrude, you're just starting a food delivery June 1st. That'll be exciting. That'll be fun. Remember insurance, always, always go there a little early. I always like to show up at least 15 minutes before I was supposed to be there. I'm nervous. <laughs> don't be on, uh, you don't want to be late for your deliveries. That's for sure. Anybody else have any questions? Well, remember, your discussion is due on Saturday at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. Two peer responses that include more than I agree and I disagree are due on Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. Your late submission for assignment two is due tonight. So if you did not get it in, you still have a chance to get some points if you get it in by tonight at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. 
and this delightful, awesome assignment in which Chef Jonathan did such a fabulous, wonderful job for you people where I expect to see wonderful little like thank you like, online electronic cards for him creating all of those things that you didn't have to think about. You didn't have to create the animal budget. You just add the numbers and it does it automatically for you. That crazy, crazy uh, long formulas that you don't have to worry about now, thinking about you know those paid break, uh, breaks or anything like that. Boom, he did that for you. And I'm pointing this way because he's right next to me on the screen right over there for me. So remember that when you are doing this assignment that is due on Tuesday, but you're not going to wait. You guys are going to get it done now, right? Now that it's fresh in your mind, right? Yes, chef, I'm going to totally do that. Oh, I'm so glad to hear it. Well, if you guys have any questions, please reach out, but I hope everybody has a fabulous week, and then next week, we get to talk about your budget. You guys are gonna figure out your labor budget this week by doing this assignment. And now we get to talk about your whole budget next week. It's gonna be great. So I hope everybody has a fabulous week. Am I right, Jeff? Absolutely. Again, get them in early. I love resubmits and the earlier you get it in, the better your chances for a good grade. So early assignments are awesome. Uh, and let me know if you have any questions. Oh, and for those who did do week two, remember you have until next Tuesday to make those resubmits. So if you did submit, there's an issue, go back, look at your feedback, go for that 100% and resubmit. You have until next Tuesday to do so. Um, that includes those who get that late submission in and you get it in now, you have until next Tuesday to fix the items, make it Make it good, make it get as many points as you can. So I hope everybody has a great, great weekend and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody next week. Bye everybody, have a good one. Bye.